Turn. Thank you, Dr. Lammert. Good morning. For people of my generation or younger, it's hard to imagine the fear that smallpox and polio outbreaks used to instill in people. I was reminded of this when I visited my mother's childhood neighborhood in downtown Chicago this summer, and she pointed out the swimming lake that she was prohibited from using as a child because its water might infect her with polio. In contrast, the greatest distress I face with respect to this virus today is that I have to hold my children down and listen to them cry during the vaccination. We have come a long way from prevention by avoidance to prevention by vaccine in a very short period of time. Our opening speaker, Professor Bill Yaklik from Duke University Medical Center, has been one of the key contributors to our understanding of viruses, which has led to this revolution in disease control. Professor Yaklik began his training in biochemistry at Oxford University at the time when the seemingly miraculous activity of penicillin against bacteria instigated intense biochemical research on bacteria. His Doctor of Philosophy research concerned elucidating the mechanism of bacteria multiplication. After postdoctoral work in Copenhagen, he joined the Department of Microbiology in the John Curtin School of Medicine at the Australian National University in Canberra. Here he initiated studies on viral multiplication, first on a pox virus related to the myxoma virus that was being used to control the wild rabbit populations in Australia, and later on Rio virus. He continued studying these viruses and also retroviruses after he became chairman of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Duke University Medical Center in 1968. Professor Yaklik's work has focused on understanding the genetic material of viruses and how that material replicates and expresses the information it encodes. Apart from learning about viruses, a major goal of his has been to look for ways to inhibit or abort viral infections. He has worked on interferon, IBT, a derivative of which is an anti-smallpox agent, and ribavirin, an antiviral agent used to control certain respiratory infections in children. Professor Yaklik has served as founder and first president of the American Society for Virology and as editor-in-chief of the journal Virology. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. And he is the 1991 recipient of the ICN International Prize in Virology. We are honored to have Professor Yaklik open this Nobel conference with his talk on the mechanisms by which viruses infect and multiply in human hosts. Thank you very much, Dr. Hofmeister. <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to open this year's Nobel Conference, the 34th in the series, with the theme of virus, the human connection. And I would like to express my thanks to its organizers for having invited me to participate. In fact, I was beginning to wonder whether I would get a chance to speak this morning. Now, the aims of my presentation will be threefold. First, I would like to review the progress that we've made in understanding the principles of virus replication and the fundamental contributions that virology has made to our knowledge concerning the nature of genetic material and the manner in which the information that it encodes is expressed. I'd also like to review the nature of the host defense mechanisms against viral infections and the strategies that viruses have evolved to blunt and neutralize such. And finally, I would like to speculate on what might be the growing points of virus research during the next one or two decades and where viruses are most likely to make major contributions to the human connection. 
You know, what makes consideration of these questions extremely interesting for me is the fact that I was there for so much of it. It started for me in 1947, just over 50 years ago, as I was finishing my undergraduate studies at Sydney University, for which the writing of a thesis in biochemistry was required. Now, this was supposed to be a rather substantial thesis, uh, not four or five pages. I don't know whether anybody ever weighed the thesis, but nobody, none of us were going to test that. Uh, we had about a month to repair it, and we're supposed to write on a topic that was given to us. Uh, now, the drill was uh, to uh, uh, set up an appointment with the head of the department, Professor Henry Priestley, who, after a minute, few minutes' pleasant chat, assigned you a topic for which you thanked him profusely. Uh, and a couple of days later, you went back and told him that while that topic was superb and fascinating, couldn't you rather write about, and here you told him what you would really like to write about, and he invariably said, great, go ahead. Now, the topic that I chose was discussion of the work that was, uh, uh, that was beginning to, to be done by the bacteriophage group at Cold Spring, Cold Spring Harbor under the uh, direction of Max Delbruck, work that was the beginning of molecular biology. Many years later, a few of us old timers were standing around during a coffee break uh, the, at a meeting of the publications board of the ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, when I rashly remarked that I thought that uh, when I graduated, I knew all there was to be known about virology. And uh, I expected an argument, and I was surprised that um, they all agreed with me. What a change, what a change from today when three to 4,000 pages are published every month in virology journals, over 40,000 pages uh, a year. It reminds me of something that uh, Molly Broad, who's president of the University of North Carolina, recently uh, said at a meeting. She said, if one took the sum total of human information, the bolus of human information at the beginning of the Rene Renaissance, at the beginning of, um, the, say, uh, the, third, the 14th century, that sum of information doubled by the year um, 1750, and it doubled again by 1900, and it doubled again by 1975, and it's going to double again by the year 2010. And by the year 2050, when many of you will be, still be active, in the year 2050, the sum total of human information will double every 72 days inconceivable but very likely. My only reaction is, I'm glad I won't be here, bon appétit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, virology actually started almost exactly 100 years ago in the last decade of the 19th century with the recognition of viruses as infectious agents or more specifically as pathogens of animals and plants. The great pioneers at that time were Ivanovsky in St. Petersburg, the first to record the transmission of a disease, tobacco mosaic disease, by uh, a suspension filtered through a bacteria-proof filter. And then Loeffler and Frosch in uh, 1898 uh, did the same experiment with foot and mouth disease of cattle, and Bayerink at about the same time uh, was responsible for um, for, uh, for, for coining the term virus. Uh, he considered viruses to be uh, living, but fluid, that is non-particulate, and uh, he coined the term virus, Latin for poison, to describe them. However, of course, it quickly became apparent that viruses were indeed particulate, and the term virus has become the operational definition of infectious particles smaller than bacteria, and unable to multiply outside living cells. Now, the primary aim of virology has always been to abort or cure virus infections once they have started, or to prevent them altogether. And the means adopted to, uh, to, to, to realize these goals, virologists have attempted to understand in detail the nature of the reactions involved in virus replication with the expectation 
that sooner or later one would be found to be susceptible to specific inhibition. Then on the other hand, extensive studies were carried out on the nature of the interactions of viruses with their hosts, that is pathogenesis, using the techniques of uh, epidemiology, immunology, cell biology, and the insights gained from the basic studies. And the studies of virus replication cycles have yielded fascinating insights into the nature, replication, and expression of genetic material. Insights that encompass not only the mechanics of these processes, but also their control and regulation. Owing to the small size of viral genomes, which encode for something like half a dozen to no more than a couple of hundred genes, and owing to the fact that both viral genomes and the proteins that they encode can readily be identified and measured, as well as produced in quantity and purified and therefore studied in detail, virology has become the model system par excellence for studies of what has been called with some hyperbole the molecular interactions most basic to life itself. Now these studies had their beginning in the late 30s at Cold Spring Harbor where a group of outstanding scientists led by Max Delbrook and Salva Luria and Al Hershey and Seymour Cohen realized that the bacterium bacteriophage system provided the opportunity for synchronously infecting homogeneous populations of cells with homogeneous populations of virus particles, thereby permitting definition in biochemical or molecular terms in a single step cycle of the series or of the sequence of reactions involved in virus replication. It's the one step growth cycle, one of the, well, the crucial discovery in virology. Before long, another superb group at the Pasteur Institute, led by Lvoff, Jacob, Latage, and Monod, joined in this effort, and very soon the work of these two groups led for the first time to an understanding of the relative roles and functions of DNA, RNA, and protein, that is, of how genetic information is stored, replicated, and expressed. And soon this new way of carrying out research, combining biochemical, genetic, and biophysical techniques and designing experiments so as to seek a yes-no answer, became known as molecular biology and later as molecular genetics. And when shortly thereafter, in uh, 1948, exactly 50 years ago, uh, Enders, uh, uh, Weller, and uh, Robbins uh, developed techniques for culturing vertebrate cells and cloning them, and Dubeco, four years later, adapted the techniques used for working with bacterial viruses to growing, plaquing, and measuring mammalian viruses in cultured homogeneous cell populations. Then virology really began to provide superb models for modern molecular cell biology. Work first with bacteriophages and then also to an ever-increasing extent with mammalian viruses led to concepts such as replication and replicons, transcription and operons, enhancers, promoters, repressor elements, transcription factors, transcripts, splicing, introns and exons, messenger RNAs, and the nature and principles and control of efficiency and frequency of translation, including messenger RNA capping, and finally, the nature of the single signal transduction pathway. Let me briefly expand upon three of these. The first concerns the work leading to the assignment and an understanding of the relative roles of DNA, RNA, and protein. Now, the key experiments in this series with a demonstration by Hershey and Chase in 1952 that when bacteriophage infects bacteria, it is the viral DNA that is injected into the host cell, whereas the viral protein remains outside. The demonstration in 1956 by Gira and Schramm that the, TMV, uh, that the, that the RNA of tobacco mosaic virus, TMV, by itself is capable of initiating infection, that is, that the RNA, the genetic material itself, is infectious. 
And finally, in, the, um, in, the, in 1958-59, the demonstration by Brenner, Jacob, and Messelson on the one hand, by, by Hoare and Spiegelman on the other hand, that RNA capable of hybridizing to one strand of bacteriophage and I, with, a, with an identical base composition to the other and is, is present in, in, in infected cells and that that RNA is capable of combining or associating with ribosomes present in cells before infection. That is RNA that fulfilled all the predicted criteria of messenger RNA. Now all these three experiments were just absolutely breathtaking in their beauty and in their directness. Now the same can be said of the papers announcing Next slide, please. Well, next slide, please. Nothing much happening here. Um, could I have the next slide? There we are. Um, the two papers announcing the discovery of uh, messenger RNA splicing. And uh, they were um, uh, an amazing sequence arrangement at the five prime ends of adenovirus 2 messenger RNA by Louise Chow, Richard Gelinas, Tom Broker, and Rich Roberts. And at the same time, and done completely independently, spliced segments at the five prime terminus of adenovirus 2 late messenger RNA by Susan Burgett, Claire Moore, and Phil Sharp. And of course, Rich Roberts and Phil Sharp received the Nobel Prize for this. A discovery that was totally unexpected. There was no predicted or previous theoretical basis for spliced genes. And the same then can be said of the paper um, entitled DNA related to the transforming genes of avian sarcoma virus is present in normal avian DNA by Dominic Stalin, Harold Varmus, Mike Bishop, and Peter Vogt. Again, totally unexpected. Um, the, implication, the implications of the discovery that the genome of a tumor virus contains a gene that is a variant of a cellular gene were enormous, especially when additional retroviruses were found to possess variants of a variety of other cellular genes. And indeed, the finding that retroviruses are capable of pirating a variety of cellular genes that, are, that encode proteins with widely different functions, including cytokines and their receptors, GTP binding proteins, protein kinases, and nuclear proteins, including transcription factors, led to the realization that they were all components of a cascade pathway for modifying protein function via highly specific protein-protein interactions, the purpose of this pathway being the transmission of signals resulting from the binding of intercellular messengers to cell surface receptors all the way to the complexes of proteins that regulate gene expression. Thus, the vast area of intracellular trans uh, signal transduction derives from the observation that retroviral oncogenes are modifi modified pirated cellular genes. So, I'd like to just quote two more examples. Next slide, please. Two more examples uh, resulting from the discovery of restriction in the nucleases. One is, represents the beginning of genetic engineering, and uh, that was by Jackson, Simons, and Paul Berg, um, by chemical method for inserting new genetic information into the DNA of simian virus 40, circular, uh, simian virus 40, circular SV40 DNA molecules containing, oh, there's a, there's a colon there, circular SV40 DNA molecules containing lambda phage genes and the galactose operon of Escherichia coli. And the other one is, um, is uh, the, uh, initiation of the first example of the use of restriction endonucleases to map patterns of gene expression. And this one, one year later in 1973, was entitled A Map of Simian Virus 40 Transcription Sites. 
expressed in productively infected cells by George Curie, Mal Martin, Lee, Dana, and Dan Nathans, who also obtained a Nobel Prize for this. Now let me now return to one of the, one of the aims of these studies that I specified earlier, namely, uh, have these studies led to the discovery of powerful inhibitors of viral replication, inhibitors that can abort and therefore cure viral infections once they have started in the host? And I'm afraid that here, progress has been slower, although there have been major successes, like uh, acyclovir against herpes viruses, gancyclovir against uh, um, uh, cytomegalovirus, um, azetothymidine and uh, didioxynucleosides and protease inhibitors against HIV, and ribavirin against uh, respiratory syncytial virus and Lassa fever, and of course there was isidine beta thiosemic carbazone or IBT against variola, smallpox virus. But uh, the major stumbling block here is not lack of targets for all viral proteins being different from, uh, from host cell proteins, uh, all viral proteins being different from host cell proteins should be easily inhibitable in the same manner that uh, antibiotics specifically inhibit the functions of prokary prokaryotic proteins. Rather, the block here is our lack of knowledge concerning protein structure. All these antiviral agents uh, are effective and specific inhibitors, but there are small molecules, and as a result, even a single point mutation tends to cause loss of susceptibility and thus of inhibitory activity. Now, what is needed is larger inhibitor molecules, but that requires much more detailed knowledge concerning the determinants of protein structure. As you know, it is not possible as yet to determine tertiary protein structure from amino acid sequences. And although the crystal structure of many proteins is now being determined, too little is known as yet concerning the induction, role, and significance of conformational changes on enzyme function and on the interaction of proteins with proteins. Thus, the cure of viral infections, once they have started, is still some way off. Now, the study of pathogenesis has also turned up a rich load of fascinating information. Next slide, please. Now, infection with viruses triggers a variety of responses. Among them are non-specific responses, including the formation and secretion of interferon. Um, let me put on my glasses here. I've got one eye that is nearsighted, the other one is farsighted. So if I really want to see, I take my glasses off, except if there's just in a critical zone where I can't see. Uh, now the non-specific responses include the induction of the synthesis and secretion of interferons. Uh, inflammation, inflammatory responses caused by the dispatch of lymphocytes to the site of infection which re represents the mobilization of the immune mechanism uh, toward, uh, against virus infections. Cytolysis by natural killer cells and the induction of apoptosis. And it also includes specific responses including generation of cytotoxic T lymphocytes that recognize infected cells by virtue of fragments of viral proteins displayed on their surfaces, and the generation of B lymphocytes that secrete antibodies against proteins specified by the infecting virus. These are all complex processes that are induced and regulated by a variety of cytokines that must be produced in, by cells in correct amounts. Over or under production of cytokines causes the immune response to be either inadequate or possibly even harmful to the host. Now, viruses counteract these processes in a variety of ways, most of which have been recognized and characterized only in the last 15 years. Thus, viruses may blunt the effects of interferons. Let me uh, get the next slide here. Blunt the effects of interferons interfere with the generation and function of cytokines, defend themselves against the killing of infected cells by interfering with the synthesis and function of MHC class 1 antigens, which are the proteins that display the viral protein fragments 
on infected cells and uh, thereby make, uh, render infected cells invisible to um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And uh, there are also um, viruses that uh, induce proteins that block the, activity, uh, the activation of complement, that interfere with the regulation of apoptosis, and uh, that express enzymes that synthesize steroid hormones that cause immunosuppression and reduce inflammation and therefore reduce the immune response. Now, so far, 30 to 40 genes are known to be involved in these functions designed to overcome components of host defense mechanisms, and there could well be uh, more than 100. Most of those known so far are present in the genomes of the largest viruses, primarily the pox viruses and the herpes viruses, which have become virtual rosetta stones for the defining components of antiviral defense mechanisms, about which, admittedly, we don't yet know enough. It is for this reason that many scientists oppose the proposed destruction of the remaining stocks of smallpox virus. Instead of destroying this virus, they argue, humans would be better served if efforts were made to determine why smallpox is so successful in overcoming human defense mechanisms and why it is such a uniquely human pathogen. Highly virulent viruses with much smaller genomes like yellow fever virus or flavivirus or Ebola virus or filovirus or rabies virus or rhabdovirus, all RNA viruses, they do not encode specialized proteins that function via any of the mechanisms that I've just described. How do they cause their extreme pathogenic effects? Because these three viruses that I mentioned are extremely lethal. The functions of all the proteins that these viruses encode are known in considerable detail, but they are all functions related to virus replication, not with interactions with host defense mechanism components. These viruses evade host defense mechanisms by generating mutations in and around of the peptides that are presented to cytotoxic T lymphocyte receptors by the MHC class one antigen molecules on the cell surfaces and are thus able to set up uh, persistent infections. But this is clearly not the mechanism that enables them to neutralize host defenses when they cause acute disease. There is a great deal to be discovered there. Let me make and uh, do an aside here. And um, uh, I would like to point out that these, namely the interactions between viral proteins and host cell proteins, these are the interactions that shape virus evolution. Viruses are as stable as other genetic units in constant environments, that is, in hosts to which they have adapted maximally. This is obvious from inspection of a fresco in a tomb in the Valley of the Kings of an Egyptian pharaoh that clearly indicates that he had survived an infection of the same poliovirus as circulates today. That is, after 4,000 years and after innumerable infectious cycles, the 7,400 nucleotide long polyobase genome, which encodes about 2,200 amino acids in the form of 12 mostly very small proteins, still induces the same pathogenic effects as it did 4,000 years ago. And the same, of course, is true of smallpox virus, which also still induces the same disease as it did in China 4,000 years ago, as is evident from descriptions in ancient Chinese manuscripts. Now, the answer to this lies in what J.D. Bernal knew all along 50 years ago when he said that the key to biology, and therefore also the key to evolution, is protein structure. Viral genomes ex experience genetic changes all the time, mostly, but not exclusively, in the form of point mutations. And RNA viruses, owing, uh, RNA genomes, owing to the absence of an error-correcting function in their, in their polymerases, they mutate several orders of magnitude more frequently than DNA genomes, as we will hear in due course from John Holland. But high mutation rates are only of very limited value in the race to evolve unless the mutated protein is more efficient in doing what the parent did. High mutation rates can be, they can merely add to the genetic load, that is virus populations contain high proportions of particles, more or less inefficient in some function. Now ability to infect a new host, however, or if the host itself 
evolves, then the situation changes drastically. For then viral and host cell proteins are provided with the opportunity of interacting with new partners with the resultant possibility of, of freedom to change. Now, clearly virology has been spectacularly successful in its first century. First, we now have a clear picture of the genes in viral genomes, the genomes of representatives of virtually all virus families having by now been sequenced. And we also know a great deal about the functions of the proteins encoded by the majority, not all, but the majority of these genes. Second, very efficient vaccines have been developed against viruses that cause many of the major, most lethal or debilitating viral diseases, including influenza, measles, mumps, chickenpox, rubella, yellow fever, rabies, hepatitis A and B, and rotavirus. Of course, there are still viruses against which we do not yet have an effect, effective uh, vaccine, a major lack of success being HIV, but it should, of course, be pointed out that we have only known about a HIV for little more than a dozen years, and we're still in the process of accumulating experience concerning the myriad of interactions of this virus with its host, namely us. No doubt Bob Gallo will deal this, with this in detail in his presentation. Third, there's the eradication of smallpox virus, the pathogen that during the course of recorded human history killed more humans than any other. A virus so specialized, so well adapted to humans that uh, we were its only host. Early in the 1920s, there were still a more than 100,000 new cases of smallpox annually in the United States. And 50 years later, there were none around the world the last case having occurred in Somalia in 1979, one of the most stunning successes of modern medicine. Further, polio is also about to be eradicated, hopefully by the year 2000, according to some projections, and it is very likely to be followed by measles virus by the year 2010. And finally, of course, tremendous progress has been made within the last 15 years in the area of molecular viral pathogenesis, uh, that is, in identifying host defense mechanism components against viral infections and of the strategies used by viruses to evade, blunt, and neutralize such. I should point out that research, research in this area is currently extremely active. In fact, it is one of the hottest areas in virology and immunology. Elucidation of the functions of the proteins used by each side will assist the understanding of viral pathogenesis and virulence and provide tools to study and manipulate the immune response against emerging viruses like HIV and Ebola and permit the construction of safe and effective vaccine strains against them. This is an extremely exciting area of future research which, particularly for the RNA viruses, as I pointed out before, will undoubtedly yield major surprises. Now, before I turn to the future, let me top off the past by pointing out that the outstanding contributions of virologists have been recognized by no less than 10 Nobel Prizes, and I'd just like to present those to you. In 1946, Wendell Stanley was awarded the Nobel Prize for the preparation of virus protein in pure form. In 1946, the work was actually done in the 1930s, purification of protein then, and he purified tobacco mosaic virus and crystallized it was a major, uh, major and, 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 uh, achievement, and in fact created uh, in the, the crystallization of the back of mosaic virus, because viruses were really still regarded, or can be regarded, as live. I mean, the crystallization of a live uh, uh, object created great interest. But of course, we should really talk about viruses not as living and dead, but active and inactive. Now, five years later, Max Tyler was awarded the Nobel Prize for yellow fever and how to combat it. And uh, in 1954, just three years later, Enders, Weller and Robbins were awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the ability of polyvirus to grow in cultures of various types of tissues. That was the first cloning of, uh, of vertebrate mammalian cells. In 1965, Jacob, Lvoff and Monod received the Nobel Prize for the genetic control of virus synthesis. And in 1966, that was a remarkable one, Peyton Rouse 
uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for tumor-inducing viruses. And this work was published by Peyton Rouse in 1911, 55 years prior, which proves that if you want to receive a Nobel Prize, you've just got to stick around long enough. <laughs> Three years later, in 1969, Delbruck, Hershey, and Luria received the Nobel Prize for replication mechanisms and genetic structure of viruses. But in 1975, Baltimore, Dobeko, and Temin received it for the interaction between tumor viruses and the genetic material of the cells uh, that was uh, there for the reverse transcriptase. In 1978, Arbor, Nathanson, Smith received it for restriction in the nucleases in their application to problems in molecular genetics, just like I said, discovering patterns of gene expression. And in 1989, Bishop and Varmus received it for the cellular origin of retroviral oncogenes. And in 1993, Sharp and Roberts received it for the discovery of split genes, that is the splicing of viral, well, of messenger RNAs. They demonstrated it for adenovirus messenger RNA. Okay, now what about the future? There is no question that the virus replication cycles will continue to be investigated intensively. However, whereas in the past, the emphasis, the primary emphasis was on the mechanics of virus replication and the role of viral proteins in virus replication. Now it is likely to be, to be placed on the interaction of viral proteins with two classes of proteins, two classes of host proteins. Proteins that permit, promote, and benefit virus replication on the one hand, and proteins that limit and inhibit virus replication on the other. Of course, there's also going to be a lot of activity in the field to discover new approaches to the, to, the, to the development of agents that arrest, inhibit, and abort viral infections, but which I'm really not going to say anything because this search is going to come from all directions and covers too many fields. Um, it will also be on the approaches to the development of vaccines, antiviral vaccines, and on the engineering of novel viral vectors with clinical applications. And let me briefly go into some of these new and exciting arenas. Now first, there's a group of proteins with widely varying functions that viruses subvert to creating an environment favorable for initiating and sustaining virus replication. Now many examples of such proteins are already known and more, many more are constantly being discovered and will be discovered in the future. They fall into two classes. Those are present in cells constitutively, that means they're present in cells all the time, and those the expression of which is induced by viral transactivators. Let us start with the former. Um, I need the next slide for this. There is, for, for, for example, the, um, the well-known case of the 750 untranslated nucleotides at the 5' prime end of, uh, of the picornavirus genome, like poliovirus, the common cold, and so on, rhinovirus. Now, this region lacks open reading frames. It does not encode any proteins. But in spite of, this, in spite of its large size and the absence of open reading frames, it has important regulatory functions by virtue of its ability to combine with cellular proteins at multiple sites. In fact, point mutations at these sites affect the efficiency of viral protein synthesis, tissue tropism, and virulence, including in the case of poliovirus, neurovirulence. And clearly the basis of all these effects lies in three-dimensional structures, three-dimensional structure assumed by the RNA, recognized by cellular proteins. Uh, I'm not going to discover, discuss in detail the next two, but then come to, come to this one here, and that is um, the, genome, uh, the genomic three prime untranslated region, and that's the other end of the RNA, um, of, uh, 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 and the plus strand leader sequence of measles virus, as well as uh, some other uh, paramyxoviruses is bound by host proteins. And the interesting thing about that is that the nature of the proteins present in cells that are permissive for measles virus replication is different from the proteins 
in cells that are non-permissive. So evidently, these proteins play some major role in virus replication. The similar findings have been reported, as I say, for mumps, parainfluenza virus 3, and vesicular stomatitis virus. Now, it's also been recently been established that the RNA polymerase of vesicular stomatitis virus requires association with all three subunits of a translation elongation factor, EIF1, for full activity. And this is strikingly similar, um, well, this is a, 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 a mammalian virus, strikingly similar to uh, the RNA polymerase of uh, the a small single-stranded RNA containing Q-beta bacteriophage. The protein, the, the, the core polymerase encoded by the Q-beta genome is totally inactive. When it combines with a ribosomal protein, then it becomes a poly G-dependent poly C polymerase. In other words, it just transcribes G, 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 G into C, 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 C. And it is only when it combines with two more protein synthesis factors, uh, EFTU and EFTS, that it becomes a highly specific polymerase capable of uh, transcribing and replicating Q-beta RNA. Okay. Um, oh, finally, there's the fascinating and very interesting case of rheovirus. Now, rheovirus messenger RNA molecules, uh, rheovirus possesses 10 segments of RNA, and so there's 10 messenger RNAs, and they have, uh, have a highly base paired structure resembling double standard RNA, and these, uh, these um, uh, messenger RNA mo molecules are capable of activating a protein kinase, PKR, that then phosphorylates the alpha subunit of another protein synthesis uh, elongation factor, EIF2, thereby inhibiting protein synthesis and limiting virus replication. But it has recently been found that in cells that contain an activated RAS oncogene, like cells, for example, that uh, have at their surface uh, the uh, EGF, the uh, uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, or that express a, an oncogene, VRB, that in these cells containing an oncogene, this protein kinase is not activated, protein synthesis is not inhibited, and rheovirus replicates to high titer. And of course, there are major implications here. Can rheovirus be used in any way to, against to destroy cancer cells because more than half of human tumors contain an activated RAS pathway, signal transduction pathway. Now the second class of uh, non-defense mechanism proteins that we like to consider, in other words, still proteins that benefit and then foster virus replication. Sorry, next slide please. Is this already the next slide? Let me have a look. Yes, um, these are proteins that are activated, or the synthesis of which, the expression, expression of which is, is um, induced by viral transactivators. And the most active of these transactivators are the SV40 of papovirus, the SV40 large and small T antigens. Now, a large T antigen is known to induce the expression of more than 100 genes, and small T antigen induces about 25. Now, T antigens may influence, uh, how, do, how, do, how do these two antigens do this? They may influence cellular gene expression by altering messenger RNA levels of cellular transcription factors. All the various uh, mechanisms that I'm giving you now, they're actually examples in the lit literature of various transactivators actually doing this. Or they can activate, uh, they, can, uh, they can alter the activity of cell cellular transcription, uh, transcription factors by inhibiting a phosphatase and preventing their dephosphorylation. Or they can uh, interact with cellular um, uh, transcription factors and thereby change their specificity. They can totally replace cellular transcription factors, of course. They can directly bind cellular DNA and they can alter the chromosomal status of cellular DNA. Um, so it is clear 
it is clear that the DNA containing pox viruses, herpes virus, and adenoviruses, and even the uh, uh, hepatitis B virus, they all encode transcription factors that modulate the expression of many cellular genes. More and more of these genes and the functions of the proteins that they encode as they affect or as they relate to the replication of the virus that induces them are now being identified and will also be fascinating, of course, to determine whether and to what extent uh, uh, and what, by what mechanisms RNA-containing viruses uh, also turn, out, uh, uh, turn, out, uh, turn on the expression of specific cellular genes. Now, then the other class of proteins I was talking about, they're the ones that inhibit the, uh, uh, and limit the uh, virus replication. And I'm not really going to go into, the, into this uh, to any extent because we've already been through uh, the various strategies that viruses employ to uh, counteract host defense mechanisms. I'd just like to discuss one, and that is the regulation of apoptosis, because viruses do regulate uh, apoptosis. Some viruses induce apoptosis and others inhibit the induction of apoptosis and they employ a variety of pathways for doing this. A dozen or so are already known and new ones are being published all the time. Now, viruses might inhibit apoptosis because apoptosis of course destroys infected cells and so limits virus yields. If you inhibit apoptosis, you in increase the size of virus yields, and that could be, well, obviously, that is to the advantage of viruses. And viruses induce apoptosis because apoptosis destroys lysa cells, and that leads to virus liberation. So there, viruses that induce the viruses, uh, that induce apoptosis, uh, do it uh, so that uh, they liberate progeny. Uh, strange enough, it appears that even the same virus under different condition can do either one or the other. Okay, now I'd like to finish up um, with two highly promising aspects of the human connection of viruses, and the first relates to new approaches to the development of vaccines. Now, let me have the next slide for this, please. Thank you. Now, there are many fast, uh, first of all, uh, there are a number of viruses against we badly need vaccines at this, uh, at this time, um, and I've listed them up there. Uh, take out influenza virus, a, an influenza virus vaccine, a new one, uh, uh, the attenuated virus vaccine has recently been licensed by the FDA, and that looks extremely good. But we certainly need uh, vaccine against HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, respiratory syncytial virus, cytomegalovirus, hepatitis C and E viruses, and uh, hemorrhagic fever viruses and, and encephalitides that are emerging viruses. They're emerging viruses because of the vastly increased mobility of human populations, which brings them into much more intimate contact with the natural reservoirs of these viruses. Now, there are many facets to the construction of viruses, uh, uh, construction of vaccines. Now, for example, one is the nature of the antigen to be used. I mean, should it, for example, be a viral peptide, a viral peptide that contains the epitope, the site against which neutralizing uh, uh, antibodies are, uh, are elicited, uh, one can use just, uh, just peptides, or one can use the proteins that contain these peptides, that contain the epitopes. Um, uh, vaccines against uh, single uh, proteins are called subunit, uh, subunit vaccines. Or, of course, one can use inactivated virus particles, and finally, one can also use attenuated uh, uh, virus strains. If one decides to use the viral protein that contains the epitope against which neutralizing antibodies are elicited, then uh, the, 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 the nature of the vector to be employed is of, uh, is of some importance. Uh, should it be a replication competent virus, like for example vaccinia virus, in which case one would have to be very careful about the virulence of the viral vector. Um, in fact, I should point out that uh, uh, a very large number of such proteins from a lot of viruses have been cloned into vaccinia virus, and if one infects with this vaccinia virus, then antibodies are made against all these, uh, all these viruses. 
but uh, so far vaccinia virus is not favored as a vector because the, it's, um, it, is, uh, it still has residual, um, although it's not a dangerous virus infection nevertheless, it still has some, some virulence. Now one can also use a, a mammalian uh, of, uh, replication incompetent virus like for example canary pox virus. Canary pox virus is a bird virus, it's, we're not, we're not uh, multiplying humans and it can be used as a carrier. One can even use plant viruses as a carrier. But altogether I think uh, one can say that uh, well, people, the experts agree that for humans in the 21st century the virus really, the virus, the attenuated virus vaccine strains should, would be the most, uh, 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 most uh, profitable for use. Uh, now, of course, many vaccines already exist that, uh, that, uh, that use uh, attenuated uh, uh, virus strains. So, of course, um, um, uh, Jenner's uh, virus, cowpox, was, was the first one of these. Um, uh, historically, such virus strains uh, are generated by passing the human pathogen through some animal host, uh, uh, often developing chick embryos or the brains of suckling mice, until a virus is isolated that, has, uh, that is the same, identical immunologically, but has lost virulence for humans. Um, but this technique is time consuming and um, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, but uh, for, um, genetic engineering has now provided us with the means of uh, improving on this method because uh, if it is possible and there are there's active research going on to identify the genes that make human pathogenic viruses virulent, pathogenic, um, it should be possible to, uh, to uh, inactivate such, um, uh, such genes and uh, uh, there's active work going on, for example, for vaccinia virus designed to, uh, to inactivate by the insertion of irrelevant, say, uh, genetic material into, uh, into the genes that cause vaccine, the residual vaccine, um, the virulence of vaccinia virus. So I think for the 21st century, uh, research in new ways using genetic engineering to construct vaccine strains is going to be a field of high relevance. And finally, I would like to uh, just mention the rapidly emerging, uh, the, the, the rapidly developing potential of viruses to act as key aids in the conquest against human disease. Now, this is because their expression vectors capable of introducing genetic material into cells with high efficiency. Uh, now, I'm not going to say much of this because uh, I will leave this area to Elizabeth and Gary Nabel who will discuss it. But I would just like to point out, that, let me just say that uh, it is indeed ironic that while throughout the course of history, viruses have been humanity's chief enemies, they are now emerging in the second half of the 20th century as humanity's chief aids in A, the provision of absolutely fundamental biological concepts, and uh, B, in the fight against some of the most deadly diseases. Okay. Now, in summary, could I have the last slide, please? In summary, the, in the first century, Virology has proved to be, uh, the, the, the first century of virology has proved to be absolutely fascinating. Um, the nature and structure of viral genomes, viral genomes, um, I can't really, viral genomes and elucidation, it is too dark, I can't read this, uh, okay. Uh, virology has proved the key to many fundamental concepts concerning the nature, structure, and expression of genetic information. The most deadly of human viruses, smallpox virus, has been eradicated, and the dreaded, poliomyel dreaded poliomyelitis virus is about to be eradicated. And highly efficient and effective vaccines have been developed 
uh, to prevent diseases caused by many of the most severe and prevalent human pathogens. Uh, and genetic engineering has now conferred on viruses the potential to play a vital and essential role in correcting non-viral human diseases and conditions. Now, with our, envi with our environment, uh, with, our, uh, the, with our horizons widening ever more rapidly, the future clearly looks fascinating, and I dearly wish that I could start again. Now, I'm not sure that I would like to be a graduate student again, but I'd love to be a postdoctoral fellow, soaking up new ideas and concepts and using new techniques to test and explore them. And one more thing, I'd love to come back just for a few days in 500 years or in 1,000 years or in 1,500 years and so on to see how knowledge is being expanded. And I'm working on doing this. Now, I'm not, <laughs> now, I'm not too keen on being frozen down because I really have, don't have sufficient confidence that I'll be appropriately thawed in 500 and 1,000 and so on years. And I've been looking at the possibility of uh, reincarnation but I've a long time ago decided if, I, if re reincarnation is, uh, is a possibility, I'd certainly like to come back as my wife's cat because, because she certainly leads the best of all possible existences. <laughs> but uh, however that may be, I hope that you'll agree with me that the first hundred years of virology have been, I'll say it again, absolutely fascinating and I've no doubt that the second, uh, that, that the second century will be even more so. Thank you very much. Wonderful overview. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My farm feels going to be mountain in California. It's shaky. Yeah. Well, I should like to know. You can skip and talk about something more than such. Do you have any answer? You need to sit close to the mic. You see all the talk, you need to sit close to the mic. We're all live. We're ready to begin our post-lecture conversation. I'd like to, before we begin that conversation, though, in, uh, make some introductions. The first introduction is of, the first introductions are the other speakers who are at the front now, and I'm going to introduce from my left to my right. The first is Dr. John Holland, who is the Professor Emeritus of Biology from the University of Sandy, uh, California in San Diego. Next is Dr. Gary Nabel, who is the Henry Sewell Professor of Eternal, of inter, Eternal, <laughs> Eternal, Eternal, of Eternal Medicine and Biological Chemistry at the University of Michigan. He's also an investigator at the Howard Hughes Institute of Medicine and director of the Center of Gene Therapy. To my immediate left is Dr. Robert Gallo, who is the director of the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland, also a member of the Department of Microbiology Immunology, and head of the Tumor Biology Program at Baltimore Cancer Center. You have already met Dr. Yaklik. Next is Dr. Alfred Crosby, who is Professor of American Studies at the University of Texas in Austin. Then Dr. C.J. Peters, who is Chief of Special Pathogens Branch at the Division of Viral and Rickettsial Diseases of the National Centers 
of Infectious Diseases and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And finally, at the right-hand side, is there something theological here on the right-hand side, is Dr. Ted Peters, who is Professor of Systematic Theology at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley, California, and also Research Professor at the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. We are delighted that all of you have accepted our invitation. In the audience is, a is an additional introduction, is Sue Cole, who is the artist of the works that are on display in the south end of the campus in the art building. Uh, we can't really see in the audience from up here because of the lights, but Sue, would you please stand for recognition? And we urge you this evening to uh, take a look at the paintings that she has present the drawings, the artwork she has presented for us. Ah, the first question from the audience, and actually one of my first questions for Dr. Yaklik. The question is, humans are no longer vaccinated against smallpox. If all stocks of smallpox are not destroyed, is there not a significant risk of a future smallpox pandemic? And I know you have been person that has made comments in the past about the supposed two repositories of smallpox virus? Well, that's a very good question. To start off with, there are, <coughs> there are of course, stocks of uh, smallpox vaccine uh, being maintained, but that is a considerable, uh, at considerable cost. My fear is that if smallpox is destroyed, then these stocks of vaccine against smallpox will be let go. And my fear is that there is still smallpox somewhere in some fridge or in some lab somewhere. That's one fear that I have. Um, the other one is that uh, is the existence of monkeypox virus. Monkeypox virus is a close relative of smallpox virus. Uh, it causes a very similar disease. Uh, it differs from smallpox virus in not being readily transmissible from human to human, which smallpox is. Um, there have been cases of monkeypox passing on to one, being passed on to one human, say a nurse or a family member who looks after a, a patient, monkeypox patient, and I think there's a case, a couple of cases, of a second transmission, but that's, 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 that's uh, as much there is. Now, <clears throat> that is undoubtedly due, due to some protein or proteins in which monkeypox and smallpox differ, and one doesn't know whether mutations will not increase the transmissibility of monkeypox. And if that happens, we've seen HIV a new, uh, acquiring a new host uh, very recently. Maybe a similar um, change can occur with monkeypox, and if the uh, if the vaccinia stocks, the vaccinating stocks against smallpox have been destroyed by them, then we would be in serious trouble. So, um, whereas I do think that, uh, um, and I, I, I discussed that with um, C.J. Peters over breakfast this morning, we have a slight difference of opinion here, but uh, we, uh, uh, by and large, I mean, we, we just want the best. Um, uh, I agree that, uh, um, the, the value of smallpox at this time uh, would be to set up a program to determine what are the, uh, how can smallpox overcome human defense mechanisms. But as he quite rightly points out, that requires uh, a very expensive P4 laboratory and so on, and requires funding, which at the moment is not available. Um, so um, otherwise, I mean, one would just say, let's keep a few ampoules ample of, of smallpox so that if in the future sometime uh, occasion arises that we do want to know more about that virus, it will still be available. But as he quite rightly points out, of course, I mean, uh, the smallpox virus has been sequenced and methods of, uh, uh, of uh, synthesizing artificially DNA are rapidly progressing and uh, I've no doubt that in, um, that in several decades, um, uh, it might be possible to synthesize again the, uh, the genome of, of smallpox. So um, it's, at the moment, it's, it, it's a debate. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I think it is important to know that we have the genes available uh, if we wanted to study the genes individually. But frankly, I might 
make a different decision than Dr. Jocklick made if I had my hand on the switch for the uh, pressure cooker to get rid of smallpox, but I don't think I would fight over uh, the rationale either way. Um, I think the last point that Bill made is the most important one. Once the sequence is out of the bag, once that cat's out of the bag, this is really a moot question. I, I don't think it matters too much because a determined germ warfare laboratory in some idiot country could probably manu manufacture one, as you say, eventually. My so, point is just that it's easier to take a vial out of a repository than to synthesize 180,000 um, nucleotides. Uh, questions from the, from the other speakers of Dr. Yaklik or comments or observations? Well, my, my observation or my thinking as I study viruses and the strategies that they have for replication, evading host defenses, how have we survived all these millennia? Mm -hmm. I think by, <clears throat> by breeding sufficiently rapidly, I think. <laughs> A bit lightheaded. And of course, one thing un until recently, human populations tended to be very isolated. There was very little communication among the continents and even the parts of the continent. And that has certainly served to limit virus infections. Now, with the enormous mobility, uh, a, uh, a, a, a f outbreak of a, of a virulent influenza virus in Hong Kong, say, uh, can be in anywhere in the United States within uh, within 12 hours, and that is a, a, a completely different situation now. There's a question from the audience: uh, Why have the French halted the hep uh, development of the hepatitis B vaccine? What did they find out to take that action? Are you familiar with that at all? No, I don't know about that. Excuse me while I read this. Uh, another question from the audience. Is there a limit to the number of viral types that humans can be vaccinated against? Can humans be over-vaccinated to a point that our own immune system is weakened? That's a very you, medically charged question. You could answer that best yourself, couldn't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any limit to the number of, uh, of, uh, of antigens against which one can be, uh, can be vaccinated. Uh, one could, of course, if one gets too much of an antigen, the antibody response might be uh, uh, excessive. But as for the number of different uh, antigens um, that we're going to be vaccinated against, I don't, I don't think there's any limit. Is there, John? Do you know? No. One. No. There, there are some interesting websites uh, maintained by people who feel that too many vaccines uh, overwhelm our immune system, particularly if they're given in a short period of time when we're young. It gets a little beyond the virus, but just the, the workings of the immune system. Dr. Peters with the... I think there are a couple of comments that are appropriate to that. One is that without these vaccines, and in the past when we had lower standards of hygiene, most people underwent the natural infections and far more natural infections than we undergo today. And certainly that's at least as much stimulus to the immune system and a lot harder on uh, the rest of your body. And the other observation is that a number of studies have been done by the U.S. military of hyper-vaccinated, if you will, people uh, who are working with a number of different agents and receive a number of different vaccines, vaccines that are not used in the civilian population at all and that are frequently very crude vaccines in initial stages of, de of development and no deleterious effects have been found in long-term follow-up studies of these people either. Can I make a comment to this? <clears throat> recently in England, I wonder whether you know about this, recently in England, um, people have become concerned with the greatly increased incidence of asthma. And they have related that to the possibility that in childhood now, we are just too clean that we are not exposed to many of the um, uh, bacterial and viral antigens to which we were exposed many years ago. And that it is um, the, our exposure to these later on in life, that that is uh, or the absent, well, I, I don't know how that ties in, but uh, do, you, do you remember? 
Yeah, I, I think that's mainly speculation. There may be something to it. You know, we're also making new antigens that we've never, uh, I shouldn't say making it, we're also exposed to new antigens that we've never been exposed to to this degree before. And latex is a good example of, of that. There's been an enormous amount sure. of latex allergy in medical staff. So it's uh, complicated. Excuse us for our side conversation here with just uh, uh, another question uh, from the audience on the 1977 papers on virus replication and the Nobel conference. Uh, none of us are on the, none of you, not me definitely, but none of you are on the uh, selection committees for the Nobel Prize selection. But the question that was asked from the audience is why did Rich Roberts and the other, <laughs> and, and Sharp receive the Nobel Prize but none of the other co-authors of their works did? Are the co-authors in order of prominence or in reverse order of prominence? So I, I was going to let the, the research scientists uh, we'll take a guess. <laughs> deal with that. But Dr. Gallo had, has a response for that. Well, I said we can take a guess. I think that the awards are usually for a body of work, not one particular paper, and are generally selected to lab leaders. The Nobel decisions, I think, are to limit the number of people who can get it. Otherwise, everyone would get one. Uh, but I think they selected lab leaders for a, a significant body of work and then pointed out some special papers uh, in that body of work. At least that would be my best guess. Authorship in biological papers is generally the <clears throat> that the senior author is listed last. And as Bob says, the senior author has most experience. Uh, the prize is, as he says, for a body of work. The senior author provides the ideas, the stimuli, stimulus, and directs the work. Um, so um, in this particular case, it's the two senior authors who receive the Nobel Prize. But I agree with the question. There has been considerable controversy in the past in several cases of why more junior workers were not included in the Nobel Prize. Um, as I say, this is just uh, the custom, it may change. Uh, uh, changing the subject, at the end of your, toward the end of your talk, you briefly mentioned the DNA vaccines, at least it was at the bottom of the slide. What do you see of the future of the DNA vaccines in which the genetic information is injected rather than the protein that directly stimulates the immune response? Yes, I didn't feel I had time to really discuss this. I know the people who are responsible for this very well. Um, this works, of course, for, both for DNA-containing viruses uh, and also for RNA-containing viruses because all one does then is to reverse transcribe the RNA in the DNA and inject that DNA. And then it, it certainly is that that, that, that is, <coughs> uh, of course, an extremely interesting discovery. If you'd asked me before, and I would have never thought that this would work because I would have thought that the that the DNA would be, uh, the free, naked DNA would be broken down and um, most cells are not adapted to taking up DNA. But it, uh, it, well, what happens is that the DNA is taken up and uh, uh, transcribed by a cellular enzyme and then of course the, uh, the protein synthesizing mechanism in, uh, in cells translates that into the protein which then acts as antigens. So the preliminary results are extremely favorable it remains to be seen now whether these, uh, these DNA-containing uh, DNA vaccines can be uh, uh, adapted to clinical use. Do you know that whether anything uh, is, is about clinical trials up with, presume are they already being held? I think Dr. Nabel might Gary, be do you know? That. Yeah, there, there are uh, clinical trials that are ongoing with DNA vaccines. There are several. Hopeful results? So, uh, uh, I, I, I think the my read on the, the data as I see it in, in meetings right now is that there are encouraging results. It seems to be uh, reasonably effective at providing T cell, particularly cytotoxic T cell immunity. Uh, although it may not be sufficiently robust yet by itself to be efficacious as a vaccine. It's still early days, but I think if one were to guess that we either need to enhance the systems using some of the approaches you mentioned yeah. with cytokines, or perhaps combining them with more traditional vaccines, and then the two together may work better than either one alone. Well, I think our panels, 
for this morning's uh, discussion, Dr. Yaklik, for his uh, broad perspective of the world of viruses. We will adjourn now until 1.30 for the lecture given by Dr. Holland.